So from the tropical highlands of Las Cañadas to the tropical lowlands here at ECHO in Fort Myers, Florida. It's a beautiful morning at ECHO, the Educational Concerns for Hunger organization. ECHO is a fantastic organization that sends seeds to development projects all around the world, and they have one of the world's finest collections of perennial vegetables. We'll be doing a workshop here today on tropical and subtropical perennial vegetables. So those of you who live in warm climates are in luck. And those of you like me who live somewhere a little colder will find that a lot of these plants will grow very well as annuals, even in cold climates. So I think you're really gonna enjoy what we see out here today. This is Abelmoscus manahat, or the edible hibiscus. It's also known as Ibica. This is one that comes from the Pacific Islands. It's a leaf crop. And there's some real nice studies on the nutrition of this species, showing that it's more nutritious in almost every category than both spinach and Chinese cabbage. So this is very, very nutritious. It has beautiful big flowers, yellow flowers with kind of a red center. It's related to okra. It's actually in the okra genus, not in the hibiscus genus, although we call it edible hibiscus. Um, it's a very nice species. Here at Echo, it has some problems apparently with nematodes or perhaps something else that makes it fairly short-lived. So it's sort of a short-lived perennial. Maybe you get a couple of years out of it. Uh, but the flavor is really nice. It's a little mucilaginous, which some people like and some people don't. Um, but I, I've grown this as an annual very successfully at my house and I really enjoy eating it. It's nutritious, it tastes good. It has a great uh, texture for thickening stews and soups. And uh, you can also eat this raw. Um, uh, I've, I've heard from some folks here at Echo that they like to use the leaves, uh, just a couple of leaves in a, in a sandwich, just like lettuce. And there's not that many perennial vegetables that you can really eat raw like lettuce. So I really appreciate that about this particular species right here. There are places where this species will grow for many years successfully, and there's places where you virtually have to grow it as an annual, depending on disease pressure and climate and everything else. So it's not the most perennial perennial vegetable, but it is very nutritious. And you can see, this is a pretty substantial looking bush right here. So um, it looks like a tree. It, it looks like a tree, yeah. How does it propagate? You grow this from cuttings, which is great. Some varieties will grow from seed too, but mostly they don't set seed. But so if you want to grow it as an annual, how long can we do it? You still grow it from a cutting if you wanted to grow it as an annual, yeah. There's also a red-leafed variety, which is not the same as cranberry leaf hibiscus, which we'll talk about later. Um, but uh, there is a red leaf variety which, which has nice big kind of palmate leaves. And there are many different leaf forms of this species. It's as variable as chaya. There's many, many different shapes. Um, and a uh, very important vegetable throughout the Pacific Islands and something we should be taking advantage of in other places. Beautiful ornamental too, when it's, when it's in flower. In fact, while we're here, why don't we talk about cranberry leaf hibiscus which is a true hibiscus. I really like this. I eat this all the time at home. I grow this as an annual and it grows about eight feet tall in one short season in, in the Northeast. So this is a very, very good grower. Uh, it's sort of a, a, another semi-perennial that will give you a couple of years, but you can keep taking cuttings and planting some more and it'll keep growing. Um, it's a very big vegetable in West Africa. Uh, I had, we were hosting a meeting of uh, immigrant and refugee farmers in my town and when people came to our garden, West Africans were so excited. People from Ghana were thrilled to see this plant there because they didn't know it was available in the U.S. And it's sold here only as an ornamental and not as a food by everybody except for Echo. So um, it's got kind of a sour flavor. And um, I like it raw. Some people find it a little too sour to eat raw, but I, I really like it quite a bit. Um, and I've taken a few years to figure out how I like to cook it. We'll take some moringa leaves, some kale leaves, or other leaves, and some of this. Chop them up real fine, and just um, scramble up some some raw eggs and coat all the greens with a little bit of egg outside each one. And then we'll make sort of a frittata. We put it in a in a pan and cook it up. Then we flip it over, which is the hard part, and cook the other side. It's very good that way, and it stains the eggs bright magenta, beautiful, beautiful color. So it tastes good, and it's very beautiful that way. This grows both from cuttings and from seed. I'm told if you prune it back hard, it'll regenerate, and that's one way to make it have a longer lifespan, is pruning it hard, harvesting it essentially harder makes it live longer, which is pretty neat. How long? Uh, I haven't heard of anybody getting it to live longer than three years. 
but that's not bad and it makes an awful lot of leaves. <laughs> Well, why don't we uh, take a walk and we'll look at our next species. Uh, we're gonna go take a look at some sweet potatoes and talk about, talk about some of their uses as a root crop and also as a leaf crop and as a ground cover. Sweet potatoes are something we usually think of as an annual crop, although they're actually perennial and they're a great example of what we call plant replant perennials, meaning a lot of the perennial root crops, if you dig a root crop, it's not perennial anymore because you've pulled the root out of the ground. So you dig some out and you put some back in many cases. Sweet potato is one that will actually root at the nodes where the vines touch the ground sometimes. They'll set down more tubers. So you could actually manage a patch like this as a perennial patch just by harvesting here and there and leaving the rest of them in place. Um, besides the, the most uh, folks in the US and Canada are familiar with orange fleshed sweet potatoes, which taste great and have a lot of beta carotene, but there are other varieties, some are purple, and in the tropics, a lot of people like white flesh sweet potatoes, which are very, very sweet and sugary. They're very nice. Um, but what, what I think a lot of people aren't aware is that sweet potato has edible leaves. And they're actually uh, substantially higher in protein than the roots are. So they make a nice complement to the tubers. Um, and um, I have found that some varieties taste a lot better than others. In other words, some don't taste very good at all and some taste pretty good, you have to cook them. And um, this is now being grown as a commercial crop in the US. Some people are so fond of them in the Philippines that there are varieties that don't even make tubers. They just grow them for the leaves. So that tells me that there are some really good varieties out there. And I would like to know more about which varieties those are and hear from people about which varieties are the best. This is also a really great ground cover. In the tropics, it'll take a partial shade pretty well and still be very productive of leaves and make a pretty good harvest of tubers. You can see here we've got it growing under banana, which is sort of a classic combination, sweet potatoes and bananas together. I would love to see uh, a lot more development of edible leaf sweet potato varieties and a lot more spreading of that information around because it's a great food resource. While you're waiting for those tubers to ripen, you might as well have something else to eat. You can buy sweet potato uh, starts from a lot of companies, which are rooted cuttings. Um, Johnny's has them, and a lot of the other big seed companies have them. What's the difference between a sweet potato and a yam? Excellent question. What is the difference between a sweet potato and a yam? In the U.S., um, we have confused yams and sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes are in the genus Ipomoea. They're related to morning glories. And yams are in the genus Dioscoria, and they couldn't be less related to sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes tend to grow low. Uh, as, a, as a ground cover, and yams are climbers. True yams are climbers. So uh, what happened is that um, we got mixed up originally because folks who had been brought from Africa called tubers yams because yams are big in Africa and had been previously. So we got mixed up about what's a yam and what's a sweet potato, and now we'll sell the same varieties in the store. Here they'll call it yam, and there they'll call it sweet potato, but they're the same thing. So we want we're interested in sweet potatoes, but tropical yams, and even there are also temperate species of those yams, are very important food resource that's really underutilized. And the air potato is another example of a true yam, and we'll see purple yam today, which is really, really, really neat. This species right here is the nopali cactus. It's these young pads that are eaten. They say it's spineless but it's only mostly spineless. It doesn't have the large spines, but most of the varieties will still have very tiny spines they call glochids. And you'll definitely notice them if you don't clean them off. Um, you can brush it vigorously. You can put on leather gloves and just brush like that, and they'll come off into the leather. Uh, or you can run them over a fire very quickly, or you can peel them. That's kind of the slowest way to make them. The texture is, uh, is a little bit slippery or slimy. So it's uh, often described as being between green beans and okra in flavor and texture, which I like quite a bit. This is used very much in, in Mexican cooking and Central American cooking, and it contains compounds that are very beneficial for cholesterol, boosting the good cholesterol and lowering the bad cholesterol. So I would say those are a very good combination of traits. It's, well, obviously it grows very well in humid tropics. It also grows very well in very dry areas, being a cactus. It also grows well in highlands, both humid and dry highlands. So it's really very adaptable. It's hardy to USDA zone eight. 
so it can take quite a bit of cold and uh, it's just a very very impressive species this species has well this genus and this species in particular have become quite problematic around the world as weeds in certain areas in Australia and other places that are very dry because they make a nice fruit on them that birds love to pass around in lots of different places uh, so you want to be thoughtful about where you're working with this and propagating it is so easy all you have to do is break off a pad and then you just make a little room in the ground you bury it maybe halfway and then you have a new cactus so very very easy to propagate sometimes too easy to propagate I think we could say um, but this is really nice it's very tough it's hard to kill and usually in serious production systems they'll coppice this they'll cut it down low and let it re-sprout because it'll produce more growth that way and it's it's going to be pretty hard to harvest those off of there whereas if you have them down nice and low you can really pick them very easily and maximize production that way that's how you'll see it in in Mexico and Central America this same species has has forms that are grown for the fruit rather than the pads in Israel they call them sabras in Mexico they call them tunas in other places they call them cactus pears and they're all very good but unfortunately the best varieties for producing pads are not the best ones for fruit so if somebody could work on that as a breeding project and that would be great but um, at this point you kind of have to choose one or the other or plant one of each because the other ones are just as easy to propagate you break off a pad and there you go so it would be easy to have a planting of, of both kinds but if I was only going to have one I would have this this is a really nice very easy very low maintenance drought resistant healthy vegetable in in Puerto Rico they uh, they blend up the pads with aloe and the, and they drink those for all kinds of digestive problems it has it's very good for cholesterol and I believe it has a positive impact on diabetes but I don't remember for sure I know more about the food uses than medicine uses uh, but it definitely has very good medicinal uses as well it's really excellent vegetable well, all right, let's, let's go visit what is likely to be the tallest perennial vegetable in any of your gardens. That would be my bet. Bamboo is really one of the most useful plants in the world. It's right up there with the, the coconut and a few of those other species they really consider to be the, the most useful plants around. Um, of course, it has many uses for, for timber, or even for plumbing and for windbreaks, construction, all kinds of things. But as a food plant, um, a lot of people don't know that you can eat the shoots of many bamboos and here in the tropics and subtropics there's some fantastic bamboos that stay in place and don't run so it makes them very manageable um, this is one of those uh, this is the genus bambusa this is bambusa textilis there's a number of edible uh, bambusa species this looks like a sort of a dud shoot from from last year maybe but there are shoots that will come up at the base of the plant and um, you essentially cut them off as close to the root as you can and some of the species will have shoots this big the dendrocalamus shoots can be really huge there's a nice dendrocalamus here and when you're managing clumping bamboos for shoot production you you take care of them differently than you would if they were for timber so you really would want in a in a, a shoot bamboo production system you only want about three adult culms at any time each year you allow one to grow up and when they get three years old you cut them out and this makes the plant it induces the plant to put out a ton of shoots so that way you have a very high yield of shoots when you're managing them like this for timber you don't get that new that many new babies coming up but when you keep a very small number of adults up basically just enough for photosynthesis then they make a lot of those shoots and you can really get very very high production that way out of them there are some good running bamboos with edible shoots as well generally dendrocalamus and bambusa are two of the best genera to eat in the tropics and subtropics and philostachys is what you probably end up eating in the colder areas and, and way up in the highlands they say that the, for the best ones you walk around and you feel under your feet where they're just starting to poke up that sounds like a lot of work to me but um, also when they come up you can let them get bigger if you put a, a bag over them with some leaves in there that, then they get big and kind of blanched like you might with asparagus or something and they stay tender but they, they can be very good size and um, some species are much more bitter than others so you want to find out what you have and compare it to a list 
but uh, there are many, many, many edible species of bamboo. And as long as you have bamboo for timber, you might as well eat some of it anyway. But it, it's interesting to play around with producing, really producing those shoots. I grow some in Massachusetts. That's pretty far north. That's pretty far north. Yeah, not this species, <laughs> but I grow some species that far north just fine. Yeah, species as well. Absolutely, some of the very best species grow that far north, in fact. Philostachys dulcis, the sweet Philostachys so grows up there. They are evergreen. Okay. Mine are evergreen and about 16 feet tall. Well, let's go on to our next spot. We're gonna visit some, uh, some taro production in a nice wet little ditch over here. Well, this is taro. Uh, and, and as we were mentioning earlier, uh, it's something that many of the varieties of taro like to be, to have really wet feet or even to grow in the water uh, as, a, as an aquatic. Down here, it's growing in a nice wet drainage ditch. Taro is primarily grown for the edible corms or, or tubers, the roots, which are very delicious. My favorite way to cook them is to shred them and make little patties with a little bit of onion and some egg, sort of like a taro latka, and they come out really fantastic, fantastic that way. They're very sweet. Some of them have really interesting colors, red or purple or other colors on the tubers. This is very nice eating. And this was a major staple crop throughout much of Asia. Um, and in Hawaii, where it was really the, the most important crop, um, is fermented into a dish called poi, which apparently is quite an acquired taste, uh, but is a way to preserve the harvest for later on in the season. There are also some varieties of taro which have edible leaves and edible stems. Generally, you don't want to assume that's the case with any given variety of taro because most of them have calcium oxalate in them, which will make your mouth feel like you've swallowed a bunch of broken glass. So you definitely want to make sure you have an edible leaf variety before you try it. But the edible leaves are very good. In Hawaii, they call them luau leaf. There's actually a company here in Florida that sells them called Taro and Tea Nursery. And they have about 10 different varieties of edible leaf taro. One's called celery stem taro. Some of them have beautiful red petioles like this, so they can be very, very lovely. And the neat thing about taro is it's much hardier to cold than you would think. This will grow halfway through zone seven, so really up into Virginia, and I've seen this over winter in Tennessee as well. So it's quite cold hardy. And this grows very high up into the highlands as well. In New Guinea, way up into the highlands, this is a very important crop. There have been some recent studies that show that taro will not suffer any reduction in yield if it's grown even in 50% shade. So this is a crop that will do very well in, in partial shade. It takes a little longer to mature the tubers in shade, but it will have just the same amount of yield, which is to me really good news. Well, this is the New World version of taro. Taro is in the genus Colocasia, and the New World genus is Xanthosoma. Um, and there is a way to tell them apart, which I always mess up, but uh, Xanthosoma comes in at a V, and you can see there's a empty airspace right after the, the midrib here. Whereas in Colocasia, uh, this will be more kind of coming across here and this will be, the midribs will be buried inside that area. So that's one way to tell them apart. Um, this species is used very much like taro for the edible corms. And like taro, it also has forms that are grown for the edible leaves. Some of which, uh, one is called belembe or um, uh, taioba. Very, very big vegetable in Brazil, now being grown in Massachusetts to sell to Brazilian immigrants uh, as, an, as an annual. And has very, very nice edible leaves and, and stalks, and they'll eat that whole thing. Um, it used to be known as uh, Xanthosoma brasiliense, and now apparently they've reclassified it as a subspecies of Xanthosoma sagittifolium. All you need to know is if you get a plant of taioba, you can eat the leaves, as long as you cook them. Um, so this is something, again, that, that will tolerate some shade. It, it will take some wet feet, although um, it's not as aquatic as many of the taro varieties are. And um, especially the edible leaf varieties of this are a great plant to grow in a sort of a semi-shady kind of moist area. Again, maybe under some fruit trees like bananas or some moringa or what's this, a Suriname cherry over here maybe. And um, produce big leaves. In fact, when leaf crops are in the shade, often they make bigger leaves because they need to have more leaf surface to capture light for photosynthesis. 
So if they can take a little shade and you put them in shade, you often get bigger leaves on leaf crops, which is kind of a nice, nice little trick. Let's go visit the super giant leaf chaya variety. You go to Echo, you don't just have one kind of chaya. You know, four, maybe five kinds of chaya, lots of kinds of chaya. So these are, this is a very nice variety of chaya, also known as Mayan spinach. It's very, very nutritious. It's high in protein. You want to make sure to cook it because it has some cyanide in it. So you need to cook it for at least five minutes in order to be able to eat it. You definitely want to make sure about that. But the nice thing about the cyanides is it keeps a lot of uh, pests from eating it while it's, uh, while it's still raw. Uh, this is a, a very tough shrub. It can live for a long time. It tolerates a lot of drought, but it can also tolerate very, very humid conditions in lowlands or in highlands. The one thing it doesn't like too much is very humid, cool highlands. But as long as there's a warm season, it seems to do okay, even if it kind of dies back in the, in the cooler, wetter season, it'll come back very nicely, even, even up in the highlands. And um, it grows from cuttings, so it comes very easily. This particular variety has leaves maybe two or three times the size of the typical chaya variety. Some of the ones you'll see in Guatemala have really beautiful patterns of the leaves, but a lot of it's air, so there's not necessarily that much leaf in there. The wild forms and some of the cultivated forms of chaya sting like a stinging nettle. So these forms are, are very desirable because they won't sting you. And uh, I appreciate that a lot about these, these chayas and I'm grateful to the Mayan people who've been out finding the best wild chayas for the last several thousand years and, and growing them from cuttings so that we can take advantage of this great nutritional resource. The other thing about chaya is it's uh, anything that's high in protein like this is going to have a high nitrogen need and you want to either give it a good amount of manure uh, or plant some nitrogen fixing plants nearby and chop them and use them for mulch or, or another way really give it the fertility it needs to, to do everything that it can do. Uh, these are perennial lima beans. There are a number of lima beans that are perennial. The species in the wild is a perennial. And uh, it, it appears that the vining kinds of limas are perennial, whereas bush limas are annual. The same seems to be true about runner beans. This particular variety is called a seven-year lima, presumably because it lives for seven years and fruits for seven years. This is a variety that really likes a dry climate, dry and hot. So how fantastic to have a bean that will live for many years in dry, hot climates. It's also something you could sort of train to create a living shade house to cool you down in, in a hot, dry climate as well. And with limas, you can either, either eat them uh, green when they're still uh, young and fresh and boil them, or you can use them as a dry bean. And people have had a lot of success with limas in the Southwest as a perennial. In some places, they'll only grow as an annual. It seems like here at Echo, they don't like humid and cold in the winter very much. But if you can avoid that, you may be able to get these to go as a perennial for a good long time. The runner beans, which are closely related, can fruit for up to 20 years. Uh, in some parts of the world if you've got the right climate. And to me, a perennial bean is just a really fantastic thing to have, a, a real good perennial source of protein. The first species I want to point out over here is Haitian basket vine, which is something that Echo has done a lot of work promoting. This is a really nice vegetable. It's somewhere between a, a shrub and a vine. Sometimes it'll be shrubby and sometimes it'll sort of climb. It's actually native from Florida. Uh, well down through the Caribbean and along the Gulf Coast to sort of northern South America. So it's a widespread species. The leaves have a really good texture and they hold their size when you cook them. Some leaves, you, know, you cook them and they kind of almost shrink down to nothing. These really hold a good texture like a collard green. They're very, very nutritious. They're very easy to grow. And again, this is usually managed by cutting and allowing it to re-sprout. And this is something that is um, I think really has been the contribution of Haiti to the sort of uh, world food situation is promoting the use of this plant and, and through ECHO that's really gotten out. This Cuttings of this have been sent to many places and a lot of people are growing this and eating it. You definitely want to cook this. Having eaten it a couple of different ways, I can say that it's not one that's great with eggs, but it's very good cooked in some other ways. Each of these things you need to find a little bit, the best recipe, the best way that you like to cook it or the way that it fits into the cuisine that you're accustomed to. 
One of the things we do in our garden, in our sort of perennial garden to help keep the pests under control is we have a lot of flowers in the aster family, things that look like daisies, and then a lot of things in the umble family, things that have flowers like a carrot flower or a dill flower. We try and have something in those families flowering all through the season, and those are attracting beneficial insects that help to control pests. They lay their eggs in caterpillars, uh, they eat aphids, so we get a lot of very successful pest control just by having the right kind of flowers flowering all through the season. That's a very low maintenance way to control pests. And we also make sure that those species that are flowering are also edible or providing some other use to us as well. So they're multi-purpose species with pest control and food production. Water celery is one of them. Water celery is one of them. It's a ground cover, edible leaves, attracts beneficial insects. I think I would have to say that of all the perennial vegetables in the world, the very finest has to be Moringa. I don't think anything else can quite compare with Moringa for its incredible nutritional power, for its multiple edible products and other products, for its medicinal uses, its ease of propagation, the range of climates in which it can be grown. Moringa is just absolutely, absolutely the best. Um, in this case, we have Moringa being grown again in a coppice system where it's cut at an easy height for harvest, and then it grows up and you can just harvest there easily. When you're harvesting, you want to, uh, you have to kind of pick all these little leaflets off, so it takes a little while sometimes to do it, but it's very much worth your time. It's not very good raw, but it's great when you cook it. Moringa can be dried and used in a powder or a dried leaf form. It's very, very rapid growing. In the north of Florida, when it uh, is killed by a frost, it'll die down to the ground, and then when it gets warmer, it'll re-sprout 15 feet in a single year. That's pretty impressive. And we've grown it from seed at our house in Massachusetts. We started it in a greenhouse. We planted it out when it was a foot tall, and we only have about a six-month growing season. By the end of the season, it was 11 feet tall and flowering. That's pretty remarkable. That's a lot more food than a spinach plant would give you in the same amount of space. In addition to the leaves being edible, which are very, very nutritious, the pods are also very good. Uh, we're maybe a little bit uh, far north for really, really good consistent pod production here. And they don't make pods when they're this size. They make them when they're larger trees. But when they're thin, like as thin as a green bean, and they'll be a good bit longer than a green bean, you can cook them up very much like green beans. So it's a green bean that grows on a tree. Those beans are also very high in protein and vitamins and minerals like regular Moringa, super high in beta, higher in beta carotene than carrots and more iron than this and more phosphorus than that. It's just absolutely packed with, with nutrition. Uh, when the pods get thicker, but still green, you can cook them and then you, um, the inner part is edible, but the outer part of the shell is not. So it's kind of like an artichoke where you'll boil it and then you kind of squeeze it with your teeth and pull and you can pull the pulp right off. And that's very, very good flavored as well. Uh, but I prefer to use them when they're thinner so they're actually, you don't have to do any extra work because again, I'm, I'm sort of a lazy cook as well as a lazy gardener. So this is Moringa oleifera, which is the most widely spread and widely utilized species. Uh, another species here, this is Moringa stenopatala. And you can see what a, what a full-size Moringa stenopatala looks like. This is a good-sized tree. It's been killed back by frost several times, but it's really rebounded beautifully. And if you look at the size of these leaves compared, would you pass me a little bit of that uh, oleifera? The leaflets on Moringa stenopatala are, are quite a bit bigger, which makes it a lot easier to harvest, and it goes much more quickly. Uh, this species also tolerates a lot more drought than oleifera, which is already quite drought tolerant. Uh, and it is also um, uh, more uh, high altitude species. This will grow up to 1,800 or even 2,000 meters in Ethiopia. So this is a good alternative to ordinary Moringa in drier or higher places, and maybe worth growing on its own instead just because of the larger leaves. The seeds of Moringa oleifera are eaten quite a bit in Moringa. They, they roast them and cook them as nuts. Uh, but usually what you do with them is you can press them for oil 
and it's a very, very high quality oil. And of course, you can use the seeds to purify water, both for their antimicrobial effect, but also they're, they're a flocculant, so they make all the solids in the water settle down to the bottom. And at that point, if you put the water in a plastic bottle and you put it on a metal roof for six or seven hours, you've purified water to an acceptable level in a, in a rural situation where you don't have access to other clean water. So these are both species that grow from seed or very well from cuttings. With the Moringa cutting, you want at least an inch and a half in diameter or, or two inches, uh, but they come very, very well that way. Species that are very widespread, at least the Oliveira, is widely grown around the tropical world as an ornamental, but very, very frequently you come across it and people don't know they can eat it. Or maybe they know you can eat the leaves, but they don't, uh, the, the flowers, but they don't know they can eat the leaves and the pods. Really, this is a plant that has tremendous, tremendous power nutritionally and uh, isn't yet being taken full advantage of around the world. Although I have to say Echo has certainly been doing their part to correct that situation. Malabar spinach loves heat. So all through the really hottest, hottest times of the year, this stuff just cranks out the leaves. In my experience, the more you harvest, the more it makes. So every time you think you cut it back, it's just gonna send up 10 more vines and grow like crazy. Um, this particular form has the red stem or purple stem, which I think is really beautiful. The green stem varieties seem like they might be a little more vigorous with a little bit of a thicker stem, but you can't beat this one for beauty. It's a little bit mucilaginous and rubbery, but I really like it quite a bit. It's very popular in a lot of parts of the world in Africa and in Asia where you want that kind of texture to thicken up sauces and stews. It's very, very nice. And uh, I really like to eat it raw. Not everybody does, but we can maybe pass them around and people can see, or if you want to just come graze a little bit and see, see if you like it. We grow this as an annual up where I am and it'll get almost this big in one year. So it's not hard to, it's not hard to get a, a heavy yield fast with Malabar spinach, which is really nice. If it's hot out, it's going to grow. This is a great one for a living shade house as well. Uh, often you'll see this also in like window boxes mm. where you don't have room for a garden, but you have room for a pot or something. And it can really climb up and make a lot of food in a very small area that way. Um, there's some nice examples of it over in the urban garden area over there where you can get a lot of production out of a small area. Many of you are probably familiar with pigeon peas. This is another one of those uh, semi-perennial crops that will often yield very, very heavily the first year, and then for the next few years will give a lighter yield, although there are some varieties that will yield well for a number of years. Uh, so there's quite a lot of variation. There's short-duration pigeon peas, which make uh, seed very quickly. There's others that take a, a much longer season. This is a very, very variable species. It's productive, it's very drought tolerant. It can grow in very high elevations. And this is the national bean of Puerto Rico, the gandul. You really can't have a meal in Puerto Rico without arroz con gandules. You need to have rice and pigeon peas. A nice drought resistant uh, midterm legume, you know, several year uh, living legume and a nice kind of agroforestry species as well to fix nitrogen to get some woody vegetation in place, maybe while you're waiting for something else to mature, like if you're planting fruit trees or longer lived trees and you want something to grow in the meantime, you can put pigeon peas in there. You can eat them green when they're still tender or you can cook it as a dry bean also. It's pretty versatile. So these are bananas and I don't think I need to tell any of you what a banana is uh, or a plantain, uh, but they are really major, major food plant in many parts of the world. Uh, bananas and plantains are the major carbohydrate staple source. Um, in the U.S., most people eat bananas uh, fresh as a dessert fruit, but the green bananas and plantains are really what most uh, people eat as a real starchy, starchy uh, survival food, staple food. And um, very delicious, very productive. You can't really give them too much water or too much fertility is what my understanding is. I actually grow hardy bananas at my house in Massachusetts and they, they produce uh, huge amounts of foliage every year, but they don't make us any fruit. It's too cold for them to do that. Uh, but the leaves are very, very useful. Even if you're not using the, the fruit, um, the leaves are, are fantastic for wrapping food, like wrapping tamales, uh, for cooking rice, many, many other things. Uh, you can make all kinds of containers and, and packaging out of them. So they're sort of like 
nature's cardboard or something like that. Um, a very, very handy plant to have. And right underneath our, our bananas here is Lab Lab bean. And that's this stuff right here, um, which um, Lab Labs are interesting because there are some kinds that are cover crop Lab Labs and those are fairly toxic. And then there are other kinds of Lab Labs that are very important foods, especially in dry areas that people really count on as a major food source. Again, in Puerto Rico, these are a big, big food. In India, these are a very big food. Both the young pods like this and the green sort of shell beans, like you would take those when they're still green and boil those, and also the dry bean. You also can eat the young leaves of Lab Lab beans. I don't think they're very good. And you can eat the flowers raw, which are excellent. And some forms of Lab Labs supposedly make tubers that you can eat, although they've never done that. I've grown this as an annual in Massachusetts and it grew to the top of a telephone pole to the point that the power company had to come and cut it down because it was gonna shut down the whole neighborhood's electricity. So this is something that can grow very quickly. It fixes nitrogen, it grows very fast, uh, and it can be a little much. Some are perennial and some are not. And um, I really wish these plants would pay better attention to the books and do what they're supposed to do uh, according to the things in my library or the things I write in my books, but um, they have their own mind, you know, they do what they want to do. But there are definitely perennial forms of Lab Lab in the right conditions with the right genetics. Um, they can definitely persist for a number of years. Well, we were talking earlier about air potatoes. And a lot of the true yams, the Dioscoria yams, produce air potatoes, uh, although usually less than Dioscoria bulbifera, the true air potato. This is one from this purple variety of the white yam or greater yam, Dioscoria alata, and you can see this variety is purple inside, which is just really, really lovely. And the main tubers, which are quite large on this species, are also purple. Anytime you see a, a colored vegetable, it usually means there's some kinds of nutrients happening in there or, or uh, active compounds that are positive for people. But also it makes children more likely to want to eat it. And it makes a lot of people feel more appetized and excited to eat it. It can also make a more marketable product. If you're selling what you're growing and you, everybody else has boring white yams and you have purple yams, that may make people more likely to want to buy what you've got. So this was a, this is a purple air potato uh, that's come off of the, the yams right here. So these are some, some yam vines and you can see they're really quite, uh, quite successful at growing these yams. They're, they're growing really beautifully. I've never seen them grow that tall before. That's pretty remarkable. And you can only imagine with all of that photosynthetic surface, with all of that leaf, these are making some great big tubers. And you'll see pictures of yam tubers really about this big. The, the genus Dioscoria is very large. There's about 600 species, and about 60 of those are edible. So there's many, many edible species in the genus Dioscoria. Some will grow as far north as where I live and overwinter every year. Some are from the highlands, some are from the lowlands, some like it humid, some like it dry. So there's a yam for almost every part of the world. And um, particularly in the US, I think this is something we really don't take enough advantage of. This, these will grow very well in many parts of the U.S. and people just don't, don't know and don't, don't grow these at all. Um, the air potato that we were talking about earlier is also in this genus and um, can produce 19 metric tons per hectare, which is pretty remarkable um, and has sometimes these nice round tubers and sometimes funny oblong ones. Some of them are poisonous and very weedy. Some of them are good to eat. It's another example of something that you can play around with. I have one that grows where I live that makes very small air potatoes, maybe the size of a chickpea, but it makes very, very many of them. And that is rated at 17 tons per hectare of these very small tubers. And that survives to USDA zone four, which is about 30 degrees below zero. K-Tuck is very interesting because this is another member of the Euphorbia family that has so many poisonous species. Uh, but this one, Seropus androgynous, uh, is, is very, very edible. It's very nice to eat raw. It has kind of a green pea or peanut flavor. Uh, it's very productive. It likes to grow in the shade, which is great. We really like shade growing vegetables. And it'll grow to be kind of a tall, lanky shrub, but it's almost always cut back and managed for, for leaf production, which is a pattern we've seen 
over and over and over again today. It's quite nutritious. There is apparently some toxicity if you eat incredibly excessive amounts. This is a very nice, low maintenance, productive, shade loving, tropical green. Very, very nice, really, really critical, especially in humid climates, but it will grow in fairly dry areas as long as it gets a little bit of, uh, of water. And um, in drier, hotter areas, you could just give it a little bit more shade and water and it should do fairly well. You guys have had good luck with it in Mozambique. Very good luck. This is winged bean. It had a lot of attention back in the 80s and early 90s. It was sort of the cool new crop. A little bit of that has faded as we realize that no plant can be the ultimate solution to all of our problems, but it is still a really fantastic species. It's one of the very most efficient nitrogen fixers on the planet. You can eat the young leaves and shoot tips. You can eat the flowers raw, which tastes like mushrooms. You can eat the green pods. You can eat the green sort of shell bean inside. You can allow them to dry and then they're used like a, basically like a soybean. You can make tofu and tempeh and all sorts of things out of them. And then some forms also make an edible tuber. So here's a species which really has so many uses. Essentially every part of it is edible. Um, this will do well in, in highlands and lowlands. Humid is, humidity is not a problem. And as long as it has some irrigation, it can handle a semi-arid situation. It's another one of those semi-perennials. You can get it to go for a couple of years. What I have seen intercropped actually right here a number of years ago was this grown on trellises with sweet potato underneath. And what was really neat about that is you have uh, a nitrogen fixing plant, so it's providing nitrogen to help the other plants growing up in the full sun where it can be happy. And then you have sweet potato underneath, happy with some partial shade, growing as a ground cover to suppress weeds and build the soil. And on both plants, you can eat every single part. That's pretty fantastic. I thought that was one of the most beautiful polycultures I've ever seen. So this is a, a, a garlic chive tire, which is sort of a classic pattern that's been replicated in a lot of places. Apparently Echo has had a lot of luck introducing garlic chives in Haiti and some other areas where there's lots of roaming livestock, pigs and goats that will really damage a lot of crops and it's hard to get things established. You can grow garlic chives in some soil in a tire and raise it up high enough that pigs and goats can't get to it. And that way you have a vegetable crop even where nothing else is able to grow. Also, you can obviously do this on a rooftop or any other bare area. I believe it's the number two vegetable in China. And China really knows their vegetables. They really like and, and eat a lot of vegetables. One of the ways they prepare it is they, um, they'll actually blanch it. They'll cover it over with leaves or cloth or plastic so that it grows up real tender and kind of a light yellowish green. And they'll eat that as a real gourmet vegetable. You also can eat it like this. We blend this up with chickpeas to make hummus. The other major vegetable in Asia is when the flower buds are coming up. It'll be a long tall stalk with a little round bud on top. And you cut a bunch of those and chop those up and they make an absolutely fantastic vegetable. And this is something that's very long lived. It's very tough. It grows well for me in Massachusetts. It grows in Haiti, it grows in the highlands, it grows in the lowland, it grows in the cold, it grows in the heat. You it's protected in Massachusetts? We don't protect it at all. Oh no, 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 not at all. For us, it's a bit of a weed actually. And if we don't eat all those flower buds, which are good to eat, you get a lot of flowers and a lot of seed. We have enough of this as a weed in our garden that we had pulled a bunch of it out and threw it in a bucket with no soil. And a year later, it was still alive and growing very nicely. This is really indestructible stuff. Well, let's talk about Welsh onion. Um, this is really one of my favorite perennial vegetables. This is another one that will grow just about everywhere in the world. And this is an ordinary scallion. Most of the scallions that people sell are Allium fistulosum or Welsh onion, which is not from Wales, it's from Asia. You can grow it from seed and harvest it when it becomes a scallion and that's all well and good. Um, we prefer to manage it as a perennial. In some places they just eat the greens. You pick off the tops and eat those, it's very nice for that. But what I prefer to do is I allow it to form a clump. I give it a year or two and it makes a nice sized clump and then I'll dig up the whole clump, I'll pull out all of them but one I'll stick that one back in the ground and, and plant it very nicely. And then the other ones, you have a huge cluster of scallions. And if you have enough clumps of this, then you can have scallions. For us, it's every spring and fall. 
You can't do it every day of the year. There's certain times of year when they're at the right stage and they're tender. We have found that when a clump gets about this big, it starts to get disease inside. It's like they're not prepared to be that large. So you have to keep dividing them every so often, which is terrible because you have to eat scallions or plant out tons of new plants. It's really an awful, <laughs> awful situation to have. For us, this is one that will come up as soon as the snow is gone, we can eat this. It's incredibly tolerant of cold, but it also does very well throughout the tropics. Elephant garlic can be managed as a perennial also. We have that at home. You'll have a cluster of about 20, 30 bulbs like this that sends up a bunch of shoots. And then when it dies back, you just pick out as many as you want and you plant some or you leave some of them in place. Uh, so a lot of the onions can be managed as perennials. So sometimes it's a question of taking a crop we think of as an annual and managing it in a different way as a perennial uh, takes a different getting used to. You don't necessarily grow it in long rows. You can't necessarily harvest it at all times. In many areas, papaya is also a very important vegetable. And you can see with the kind of yields you get on these, there's plenty to eat as fruit and plenty left over to eat as a vegetable as well. Especially in areas like this in the subtropics where you do get a cold season. And sometimes you know those papayas aren't gonna ripen any further and you don't want to lose them, you can take them and eat them as a vegetable, but any time of year they're very good. Uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, green papaya salad is a, is a pretty major food and one of the ways to prepare that is to grate the papaya or chop it into very small pieces or thin pieces and then you mix that with a very spicy blend of things. When we do it, I like to do it with chunks that are almost turning orange a little bit and then I'll put in uh, ginger, and fish sauce or some kind of salty sauce like a soy sauce, watercress, um, some shallots, and uh, some umeboshi vinegar or some kind of a, of a tart vinegar like that. So you get a tart and spicy blend with the green papaya. It really sets it off nicely. It's essentially a, a zucchini that grows on a tree. It's a big, a big vegetable melon, like a green squash that grows on a tree. Um, the young leaves of papaya you can also cook, although they're, they're fairly bitter, I think. I don't think they're nearly as good as, as the fruit. There are papayas for most parts of the tropics, subtropics, and, and highland tropics.